Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and I've got a few things to share with you tonight. A couple of little things up front, and then later on I'll get into what I, you know, the meat of this. And so we're going to start out with this article from the Gateway Pundit. Check this out. Yeah, more than 175,000 tickets requested to see President Trump in Wildwood, New Jersey on Tuesday. This is huge, folks, because, yeah, it says this is historic. First daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, broke the news on Monday that 175,000 tickets were requested to see him. And... Last week, Republican Jeff Van Drew told Maria Bartiromo that more tickets had been requested for the upcoming New Jersey rally than any previous Trump rally. Is that something or what? And I've heard that it's probably more than any rally a president has had. So, yeah, is that fantastic or what? Now, here's from... Jack Posobiec. I'm not going to play the sound. I'll just show you the picture. But yeah, these are people already waiting out there. They're camping out tonight. It's not real warm, but um, evidently they allow them to kind of tag team a little bit so one person can hold their place and then the other can go in the car and warm up or whatever the case is. And then they've got people making food along there and, you know, with grills and they've got you know porta potties and all the stuff they're gonna need but look at that a crowd of people oh see i was really naive when i went to a trump rally because i didn't have any idea there'd be that many people and i thought since i had a ticket you know that meant i was going to get in yeah it didn't happen <laughs> so i wouldn't be able to stay out for a night like that it just would not work out with me but you know more power to them there's a lot of people folks lots and lots of people so as always i'll put these links down below you can see them for yourself here's another one that i just wanted to share with you i'm not sure the significance of it yet but i thought i'd share it with you because this was um u.s attorney durham announces appointment of new criminal chief i just thought this was very interesting and check out what she has already you know this is what she was doing miss carwin most recently has served as chief of the district's major crimes unit supervising the prosecution of crimes involving immigration human trafficking and child exploitation civil rights and hate crimes government program fraud and environmental crimes so it sounds like she's got some uh, good experience there. And she's also served as deputy chief of the district's financial fraud and public corruption unit. Yeah. And as an organized crime and drug enforcement task force attorney. So she does have some experience. I'm not sure why they're adding her in. Well, I think they had somebody else resign or whatever. I don't know. But I think the timing is interesting. That's just what I'm going to say on that. And um, she's heading up this, you know, criminal division. The district's criminal division comprises four program-based units, violent crimes and narcotics, financial fraud and public corruption, national security and cybercrime, and major crimes. And so going to be interesting to see what happens there because he says, you know, she's dealt with, she's done it all, prosecuting violent criminals, drug traffickers, financial fraudsters, corrupt pu public officials, and a wide variety of other wrongdoers. So sounds like she'll be a good addition there. Now, when it comes to the U.S. attorneys, they really are specific to a certain district, and this is for the District of Connecticut. So just wanted to point that out. I don't know, maybe Durham needs more help or you know he needed somebody different in that position just thought i pointed it out anyway this right here is a statement from the press secretary and it came out uh, today when i'm recording this but it'll be yesterday when you see it and she said today's stay from the supreme court is a massive win for american taxpayers american workers and the american constitution this decision allows the government to implement regulations effectuating long-standing federal law that newcomers to this country must be financially self-sufficient and not a, quote, public charge on our country and its citizens. Two courts of appeals had already ruled that the government should be able to implement these regulations, but one single district judge's nationwide injunction remained. 
As two justices pointed out today, the expanding practice of district courts entering nationwide injunctions raises real problems about the proper power of a judge to decide only the case before him or her. Okay, and here's the actual document. Gorsuch and um, who else was who was the other one here? Just a minute. Uh, yeah, Gorsuch and Thomas were the ones that concurred, and then um, with this, uh, the others were wanted to deny the application. And uh, this was written then when they, when they say uh, Gorsuch concurring, then that means that it was written by the other person. So in this case, it was written by Justice Thomas. And he goes through, you know, a lot of this. Basically, there was the Department of Homeland Security had a rule and they were trying to define the term public charge because they're trying to keep immigrants from sponging off of our government. And, you know, that's a natural and it, it actually was pretty much what we've had for a very long time. It's just now that it's become an issue because the, you know, the Democrats don't want that. So um, they're trying to, you know, they had this one judge who decided that he was going to put an injunction. And the problem is when they do that, it like stops it for the entire country. So what's been happening is when they do these injunctions like this, they're stopping a law that was put into place and they're stopping it for the entire country just because they don't like it. It's like one person doing this, one judge has the power to do that. And that should be kind of scary to all of us. Well, if you go down here to the second page, uh, you know, he tries to explain it. He does a good job explaining it and everything if you want to read the whole thing. But I think if we start here, it'll be okay. Today, the court rightly grants a stay, allowing the government to pursue, for now, its policy everywhere, save Illinois. But in light of all that's come before, it would be delusional to think that one stay today suffices to remedy the problem. The real problem here is the increasingly common practice of trial courts ordering relief that transcends the cases before them. Whether framed as injunctions of, quote, nationwide, quote, universal or, quote, cosmic scope, these orders share the same basic flaw. They direct how the defendant must act toward persons who are not parties to the case. In other words, they have a much larger scope than they should. Um, you know, like I said, a nationwide one takes out everybody. It doesn't, it's not specific to the district where that court is ruling or, you know, how can they do that? How can they affect the entire nation when we're not in their jurisdiction? Equitable remedies like remedies to like remedies in general are meant to redress the injuries sustained by a particular plaintiff in a particular lawsuit. When a district court orders the government not to enforce a rule against the plaintiffs in the case before it, the court redresses the injury that gives rise to its jurisdiction in the first place. But when a court goes further than that, ordering the government to take or not take some action with respect to those who are strangers to the suit, it is hard to see how the court could still be acting in the judicial role of resolving cases and controversies. Injunctions like these thus raise serious questions about the scope of court's equitable powers under Article 3. And this really is the heart of it. Legislating from the bench, folks. Legislating from the bench. And they're not supposed to. Their only job in the courts is to interpret the law. They are not supposed to be making law. And that's the problem that's going on. And he goes on to say, it has become increasingly apparent that this court must, meaning the Supreme Court, must at some point confront these important objections to this increasingly widespread practice. As the brief and furious history of the regulation before us illustrates, and that was the first part that I skipped over because it was like it went to this court and this court and this court. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you want to read that, it'll be there. It'll be in the link down below. You can read it there. As the brief and furious history of the regulation before us illustrates, the routine issuance of universal injunctions is patently unworkable. So in chaos for litigants, the government, courts, and all those affected by these conflicting decisions. 
Rather than spending their time methodically developing arguments and evidence in cases limited to the parties at hand, both sides have been forced to rush from one preliminary injunction hearing to another, leaping from one emergency stay application to the next, each with potentially nationwide stakes, and all based on expedited briefing and little opportunity for the adversarial testing of evidence, which is kind of the checks and balances, you know. The judges hear the difference of opinion and, like, you know, we're watching the impeachment trial and when you're watching it, you're hearing both sides of it now. That We didn't get a chance for that before, but now we can hear both sides and we get to hear people bringing things out that the other side's not bringing out. And that's what the courts rely on especially the Supreme Court, they go back and they see what the history was and what the arguments were that were made on both sides. And that's how they end up determining their, you know, their ruling themselves. This is not normal. Universal injunctions have little basis in traditional equitable practice. Their use has proliferated only in very recent years and they hardly seem an innovation we should rush to embrace. By their nature, universal injunctions tend to force judges into making rushed, high-stakes, low-information decisions. The traditional system of lower courts issuing interlocutory relief limited to the parties at hand may require litigants and courts to tolerate interim uncertainty about a rule's final fate and proceed more slowly until this court, the Supreme Court, speaks in a case of its own, but that system encourages multiple judges and multiple circuits to weigh in only after careful deliberation, a process that permits the airing of competing views that aids this court's own decision-making process. The Supreme Court uses the arguments from both sides to end up making their determination as to what the ruling should be, the final ruling. The rise of nationwide injunctions may be just a sign of our impatient times, but good judicial systems are usually tempered by older virtues, nor do the costs of nationwide injunctions end there. There are currently more than 1,000 active and senior district court judges sitting across 94 judicial districts and subject to review in 12 regional courts of appeal. Because plaintiffs generally are not bound by adverse decisions in cases to which they are not a party, there is a nearly boundless opportunity to shop for a friendly forum to secure a win nationwide, which is what we saw happening. They'd all, you know, flock to the Ninth Circuit Court so they would get a favorable opinion for the liberals. The risk of winning conflicting nationwide injunctions is real too, and the stakes are asymmetric. If a single successful challenge is enough to stay the challenged rule across the country, the government's hope of implementing any new policy could face the long odds of a straight sweep, parlaying a 94 to zero win in the district courts to a 12 to zero victory in the courts of appeal. A single loss and the policy goes on ice, possibly for good, or just as possibly for a, some indeterminate period of time until another court jumps in to grant a stay. And all that can repeat ad infinitum until either one side gives up or this court grants certiorari, which is where they decide they're going to hear the case. And what in this gamesmanship and chaos can we be proud of? I concur in the court's decision to issue a stay, but I hope, too, that we might at an appropriate juncture take up some of the underlying equitable and constitutional questions raised by the rise of nationwide injunctions. So what, you know, Thomas is saying here is that they need to make sure it, it needs to go to the Supreme Court and he sees that it is likely going to end up there, that they're going to have to come to grips with this because what happens is if you allow these appeals courts, it comes down to one judge deciding whether this law will go through or not. And it's just simply not fair. It, again, it's legislating from the bench. So I wanted to point that out to you. I'll leave the link down below. You can read it for yourself if you want to. And then over here, I want to uh, point out this guy. This is Eric Hirschman. Now, if you did not watch the hearing today or the trial, uh, this guy was stellar. He was, uh, well, I have to say Pam Bondi was also stellar. She's the one that 
presented the case about Hunter Biden, and she just put all the facts out there, well, at least most of them. It was really good to hear it, and probably the first time a lot of people have heard that, although I did see that the uh, you know mainstream media is trying to say, oh, there, here's all these fact issues and oh it wasn't valid and it's like no it was it was definitely valid because they had to lay that down and say here's the thing you know hunter biden's at the center of this because the democrats kept mentioning him every time he turned around so they opened the democrats themselves opened the door and so they only have themselves to blame and then this just laid out the case here here is why president trump had reason to be talking about corruption and to want, you know, the Ukrainian guy to look into the corruption, especially of the Bidens. So it was very, very interesting. And that happened about two hours before the dinner break. So uh, about four o'clock, maybe, I guess. I don't know. After a while, it all kind of blurs. Well, this guy was after her. He was right before the dinner break. Okay, so about five o'clock. His lasted for about an hour. I was going to play clips of it, but it takes a long time to ferret out the clips. And, and it was an hour long, so it would take a while. But I will leave the link down below so you can watch it yourself. Because this guy, here's what this guy did. Now, there's not a lot of information about this guy. This is all, this is from his, the law firm that he's part of. And um, it just tells a little bit about him. He does have a little bit. He um, led a sale of Southern Union to energy transfer equity. So in other words, he has more experience with energy than Hunter Biden. <laughs> so there you go right and he actually he was chief operating officer of southern union i mean he's had some pretty high level jobs here so um you know there's not but there's just not much about him at all but he did a superb job the thing that he's going to be known for is he made the case for impeaching obama <laughs> He really did. I couldn't believe it when he started in on it. And he said, well, guys, if you're going to say this is impeachable uh, behavior, let's take a look at Obama and see and apply your standards to him. And then they he showed the clip of Obama talking to the Russian guy, you know, saying, oh, after the election, I'll have, you know, more flexibility. And, and so it, it was a great day of red pilling if people were watching. I hope they did because there were clips. I mean, they had the clips. They played the Joe Biden clip, you know, they played that. They did a good job. And the thing about it is they're being much more humane about this than the Democrats were. And it's becoming obvious because those first three days, well, the Tuesday and then Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, the Democrats were like lengthening everything out, saying things over and over and over and, you know, using the same clips over and over and over because, well, they didn't have anything else. And so they had all these things, you know, they, they just were very repetitious. They could have compacted it all down in much shorter time. And I think the senators are going to respond favorably to that because the, the Republicans are giving them a break. You know, especially that Saturday thing. We've talked about that. It was nice for them to have a little downtime that it didn't last all day long. And they got to actually rest up. I mean, some of these senators are getting up there in age. And when you have those long days... <laughs> it can kind of get to you. That first one, the 12 hours didn't get done until like one thirty, two o'clock in the morning. I think that toll <laughs> took its toll on those guys. So anyway, I wanted to point him out to you. Here is the actual thing. And it starts about four minutes in. This is about 4.08, somewhere in there. And it lasts for about an hour um, or so, I think. And he did just an excellent job. So probably, I think probably about 5 o'clock p.m. is when it started, uh, if you were watching. But if you go here, I'll, like I said, I'll put the, the time down below. And it, right before him was, was 
uh, Pam Bondi. She's the one that was doing the Hunter Biden thing. And then before her was the lady who did Rudy. She defended Rudy. So they had like those three right in a row. I thought they did a great job. And they're a little more lively and have a little more energy. I don't know what the deal is, but the Democrats just seem so, I don't know, blah. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I got tired of listening to Adam Schiff. He just kept going on and on and on. And by the way, if you haven't seen the newest body language ghost, you need to see it because she does the Democrats when they came out for a presser after all of this. Well, either at the break or at the end. I'm not sure when it was, but oh, it was funny. Oh, it, it was it. She did a good job. And just her observations, you sit there and you look at it. And yeah. So, yeah, they the Democrats. Yes, there was a demeanor difference between the Democrats talking about what's going on and the Republicans. And there's just huge difference. Now, I want to take just a couple minutes here at the end and, and tell you a couple of my thoughts here. First of all, it dawned on me this morning that what has been going on here in this whole trial is that the house managers have been doing exactly the same thing that has been done to general flynn this is their mo this is what they do they have all this evidence and the government you know we've talked about this brady evidence this is what's going on with flynn right that they're not producing the brady evidence well brady evidence is Evidence, when the government presents a case, they prosecute somebody, they are required because they kind of have, you know, all the aces in their hand. And so they're required by law to turn over any exculpatory evidence they have to the defense. So if there's anything that's going to make the defendant, it, that could mean the defendant was innocent, they need to turn that over. And that's not what they've been doing with Flynn. But then again, I think the reason they haven't is because it's being used in grand juries, possibly, at least most of it, I think. Anyway, so this is what's happening in this trial. When you look at it, it was like, oh, why didn't I see that before? That is what this whole the House Democrats are doing. They withheld a lot of exculpatory evidence because they still have not released the transcript of the ICIG, the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community. They haven't released that. And you know the reason they haven't released it is because they don't want to see in what's in there. There's stuff in there. Well, first of all, I'm sure it names he who shall not be named. But you know, they just don't want people to know what's in there. And I think from what the Republican House members who have, who were there have said that there is definitely exonerating material in there. That's really what's going on. When I thought of that, and then I realized what they had done on Saturday, that's what they did on Saturday. That was their case. They were showing how this exculpatory evidence was not being given over to the defense. It was not being revealed to the public. And here was all this evidence that should have been put out to the public to counterbalance this one-sided type thing that was going on. Well, you know, it's now getting out. So that, I think, they kept saying on Saturday that they, um, you know, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they you know, show you this. They didn't show you this, did they? Why didn't they? You got to think about those things. And I think that's what they were doing. Because remember, most of the people that are in there in the Senate are probably lawyers or at least have some legal in, you know, knowledge. And so I think they probably understand the whole Brady evidence thing. The last thing I wanted to touch on is this whole John Bolton book. Okay. I, first of all, we have not seen any confirmation that this anonymous source is even telling the truth. You know, it could be another fabrication. There have been a lot of fabrications over the last three years. So we don't even know that. And we don't know what it exactly says. We know, though, that this is the same old, same old playbook. This is what they did with Kavanaugh. And, you know, they all of a sudden at the last minute, there's this person that has to be talked to. And if you don't talk to this person, you know, they did it with Lev Parnas. 
you know, and now they're trying it with Bolton. And I, first of all, I do have to wonder how Bolton is able to write this book. I mean, he had to have some kind of permission to do it, I would think. Knowing enough about security and national security, especially, it seems to me that if he was national security advisor, which he was, then he would need to have that manuscript gone over by people to make sure that there wasn't anything in it. Now, from what I gather, what happened was he sent some copies to the NSC to allow them to peruse it. Well, the NSC is got the Vindmans in it. And so, yeah, it got leaked. Gee, I wonder how. Oh, so, um, yeah, I would dismiss it pretty much. And if they allow the, the problem is if they allow this, then it's never going to stop because you know the Democrats will keep producing. Oh, wait, there's just one more. And it's kind of like what a Mark Dice video. But wait, what's this? And they'll produce another one. They can keep making things up from now until who knows when. And it's just going to drag all this out. I honestly wonder if they're not trying to drag it out so they can claim that Trump can't do the State of the Union address. Oh, that's going to be epic. <laughs> it's going to be great. Anyway, so that's just my thoughts on it. I don't know. I I don't put a lot of stock in John Bolton's book because, first of all, I don't know that that's what it says. And secondly, I just don't think it's going to change anything because it doesn't change the fact that Zelensky himself said there was no pressure. And, you know, you can't say... Well, yeah, I know you thought there wasn't any pressure, but there really was. You just didn't know. They're making Zelensky out to be stupid or a liar, one of the two. And I just, I can't believe that they're doing that to one of our supposed allies. Anyway, so that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all later. Bye.